All right. Uh, welcome to week four. Um, just so you know how the next little bit's going to go is today there's a lecture. Next week there's a lecture, kind of. There's no slideshow to go with it. It's I do demonstrations on the board and stuff. We do a design as a group, and I cover odds and ends um, that are good to know but not tested upon, that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> and I will also be handing out the assignment next week. So, since everybody's been, lots of people have been panicking, when's the assignment going to come? When's the assignment going to come? It's coming next week. So, no, you don't have an assignment yet. Congratulations. All right. So, today is a two-part lecture. As I sent out an announcement that I updated the slideshow. Sent that announcement out last week. Um, I'm going to start with physical design, then I'm going to talk about normalization. Normalization is a hard topic. Uh, a lot of people find it quite painful. Um, the good news is I don't test extensively on it. Um, more and more, more than anything else, we just need to understand the definitions for testing purposes. Um, and there's one lab attached to it, so it's not the end of the world. But I'll start with the physical design. So last week we covered the conceptual design and sort of logical. And the next step after that is physical design. And you guys already did one in lab two. And it's also, Lab 4 is also physical design in the sense that you are using software to actually create a database diagram that's actually very specific. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the different bits and pieces in that. So, when you talk about physical design, we already know about the entities and attributes. When you talk about physical design, it goes from entity to table and then attribute to field, column. There's a few different people use that phrase, that word interchangeably. Uh, field and column is the same thing. Uh, but one of the most important parts of the, the physical design is choosing your data types. So you, in Java, you guys have started learning about pr the primitive data types you find in Java, also known as string, integer, possibly date or time, I'm not sure. I don't program in Java, so, you know. Um, and you got floats and you got booleans and miscellaneous. Those are called primitive data types, as in they're the most basic data type that you can use to make stuff. Um, now, in databases, data types are actually significantly more extensive. And when you, before you start choosing your data types, there's a few questions you need to ask. And they come, and once I go over some of these questions, then I'll show you guys some of the choices of data types you have, and you'll understand why you want to ask these questions. Uh, the first one is, how big is this data? An American zip code is only that long. A Hispanic name is that long. Right? You've got postal codes, you've got addresses, phone numbers. They have different needs, um, prices, uh, coordinates, that kind of stuff. They all have different needs and therefore the size of the data is different. Um, you know, are you writing up an article, a story, and a complete set of notes? Then, you know, the needs are different. Um, is it numeric, as in, is it a number or not? Do you need decimal places or not? These are all the kinds of questions that you tend to ask. Um, if it's a date, I'll always say this right off the bat, if it's a date, include the time at the, at, as well. Um, even if time is just set to midnight, if you have anything that's supposed to be a date, and the exception of the rule is very minor, uh, for that, but essentially you want to usually include date time. Um, how big is the text? But in other words, you know, you just need a little bit of text, lots of text. And then the last line, as I say, is just say no to blobs. Blob stands for binary large objects. Uh, all databases support these in one way or another. They are terrible. They're database cancer. Um, lots of people abuse them. Lots of people abuse them. There is only one valid use for it, and it's to, stare, to store characters that you normally wouldn't with your normal encoding. For example, Latin languages need 8 bits to be represented. On the other hand, Asian languages need lots and lots of bits to be represented because they have this crazy alphabet that has too many characters in it. That also includes extra little things to modify those tons of characters, depending if you're not talking Korean, Japanese, or Chinese. Even though they look similar, the rules of engagement are a little different. Or you're talking about Japanese that have four separate alphabets. You know, so 
that's the only reason you use a blob. A lot of people used to use blobs to store files. They'd upload pictures, music, uh, scans, you know, all kinds of binary type information into the database, causing massive amounts of bloat. There are ways to handle it um, properly. And in a probably next week I'll talk about how you'd handle a, a blob. If somebody says, I want you to store my pictures in the database, I'll show you how to handle that. And the answer is, don't put the picture in the database. There's much better ways to do it than that. All right, basic data types, one. So you guys learned about primitive data types in Java. String, integer, float, boolean, that's pretty much the four. Or if you don't have float, then it's a double. You know, they're more or less the same thing. In databases, you have choice a little bit. There's something called character. Uh, often it's abbreviated to car. And it's a fixed length string. In other words, if you say it's car six, it will hold six characters and only six characters. No more than six characters. There's a catch with that one because it will always store six characters regardless. So even if you put in the letter A into a car field, it'll actually pad the rest with null values. So it's always occupying six characters of space. This was an important data type way back in the day. Back, remember last week or two weeks ago, I talked about the old tape drives where, you know, you'd watch the movies and the computers are accessing the tapes and the tapes are moving back and forth. When they knew exactly how many characters a field was, it knew how many millimeters to move the tape to jump fields because it knew exactly how long each field was. That's why there's a fixed length. Um, a few years later, somebody came up with a clever solution because character fields can take up a lot of room especially when the media was limited. So they came up with something called character varying, also known as a varchar field, which you guys have probably played. You've seen those if you did lab two. It's a variable length string. In other words, you set the maximum length, and it will occupy the number of characters you put in plus a special combination of bits. Um, it's not a full byte. It's basically a terminator character that, that's put into, the, into that field. So if you put in the letter a, it'll occupy one byte plus, you know, a little chunk. And that little chunk tells it it ends here. Um, most modern modern database systems, there's no difference between a varchar field or a character varying field performance-wise. There once was a time. It made a big difference. Um, second. All right, most people are sitting again. So there once was a time the character field had a distinct performance advantage over var character varying because the database server knew exactly how far to move the tapes. Whereas with the character varying, it had to read until it hit the end and then it had to start guessing how far everything went. Nowadays, database servers are so fast and so efficient and our storage medium is so fast. And I'm th some of you, I didn't even talk about the 5400 RPM drives, the really slow hard drives that a lot of shitty laptops come with, are still way faster than what we used to use years ago. And the performance gains from using a character field is non-existent. And specifically with Postgres, they say explicitly in documentation, there is no performance gain. So you're better off using care of var car over car because there's no advantage. Um, now you have to be careful with these maximum lengths or the fixed lengths because depending on the database server, it's going to do one of two things if you feed it a character, a string that's a little too long. Some servers will blow up. You try to put data in, you say it's six characters, you fed it seven characters, it goes data too long for field. Other database servers truncate your data, whether you want, it doesn't even tell you did it, it just... This is six characters, you fed it eight, it kept the first six, it discards the last two and pretends nothing ever happened. Uh, there's advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, one, it doesn't blow up. On the other hand, you lose data. So, uh, and I can't remember, Postgres will truncate, but give you a warning, MySQL will truncate and not say a word. Uh, Oracle will just say, you stupid idiot. 
And uh, Microsoft SQL Server pretty much does the same thing. Um, Boolean. Not all database servers have Booleans. Uh, MySQL, for example, does not have a, bo a Boolean. It has something called a tiny integer, which it gives you 0 to 9 possible values of yes or no. Just like most significant others. Yes? No? No, I don't know. Somewhere in between yes and no. But usually we use 0 and 1, which is, you know, basically what a Boolean in is in Java is 0 or 1. Postgres has true Booleans, which is, it actually has, it's, it's what they call a tri-state Boolean, which is a little misleading. A Boolean, most people think of Boolean as being yes or no, true or false. With database servers that allow nulls, you can have true, false, I don't know. That's not a varying shades of I don't know. It means that it was never set. So, yes, it's true. No, it's false. Who knows? Um, believe it or not, that's actually really handy to actually have a third state on a Boolean of we, this was never answered. Um, and then you got the integers. There's uh, Most database servers have three. They, they, they're called differently depending on what server, but in Postgres, you've got small int, integer, and big int. Uh, big int, I used to actually have a slide with the actual number. Uh, it's like a 37-digit integer. It's a really big number. Um, it also has something called decimal, and other database servers call it numeric. They're essentially the same thing. Um, that is for um, numbers that have a specific length of decimal places. For example, money. Have a de specific set of decimal places. Um, Postgres actually has a money data type, but notwithstanding that, the, usually the way it's defined is numeric is the common term for ANSI, uh, ANSI data types. And if you feed it a 5, 2, the first number, the P, stands for the precision, and then the S is the scale. Depending on other database software, they may change what those letters mean. But essentially, the first digit is how many numbers are there total? The second number is how many of those numbers are reserved as decimal places? So if you do a decimal 5-2, it means that you will have three digits before the decimal places, two digits after. Right, so let's turn it around so I'm facing for you, so facing for you guys the right way. Right, three before, my head's the period, digits after. And, and it'll only ever hold up to 999.99. After that, it'll roll up and basically give you an error if the database server is sane. Otherwise, it'll actually roll back and start back from zero and start counting up again. Um, very few do that. And it will do the rounding for you. So the last two digits, if you go 1.35, it'll become 1.35. Three four, you know, three five. I'll be one three five would become one four for two decimal places. So that's what the decimal does. Um, it's really good for financials uh, because a lot of people don't realize that most financial applications actually track decimal places to more than two. It just rounds them to two for display. It usually tracks them at four digits of precision and lets the computer figure out the sort of the um, rounding after that. Um, depending on this, the financial application rounding rules change. Go figure. Um, float. Same thing as a real, a double precision. It's a huge number. It's the same as basically as what you have in Java. So if you guys play with floats in Java, floats in the database server is the same idea. Date. It stores the year, month, and day. The time stores hour, minutes, and seconds. Um, then you've got something called timestamp, also known as date time, depending what database server you're dealing with. Uh, the reason I have to point that out is pretty much every database server has a data type called timestamp. MySQL timestamp means something different. It's a special data type. That it's a date and time that's set automatically, as opposed to everybody else that calls it a timestamp. Um, and it stores year, month, day, hour, minutes, and seconds. Uh, and Postgres happens to go to uh, uh, 
ten thousandths of a second of precision, which is why Postgres is very popular with um, the scientific community. Like it can track activities as fast almost as a CPU can create them. So it's really good for that. Um, another type, the next one should say X types two. I don't know why it still says one. Um, second one is interval. The last one is interval, which is an interesting data type and almost all servers have this. Um, it's basically an integer, but it counts the amount of time passed. Well, what is it? I, how long? I don't know. It basically, it'll say 552 seconds have passed. Since when? Who cares? If you just need to track how long something took and you don't care about when it happened, that's what intervals are for. Um, often you'll see intervals in call centers, keeping track of call times, on phone switches especially. Because what it'll do is it'll track when the call came in, and instead of tracking call started here, call ended here, It'll go, call started here, this is how long it was. Therefore, we can do math to calculate how long the call actually was and when it ended. But most systems don't, the people care about when did it come in and how long did it take. They don't care when it ended. Because you can figure out where it ended based on the interval from when you started. And there's different levels of precision for intervals. You can actually get it to the go to the point where it's hundreds of thousands of a second if you want. Um, you know, that's the nifty thing. So those are the primitive data types. There are, if you actually went up and pulled up the Postgres documentation for data types, it's got tons. Uh, last time I checked, it has uh, some 50 odd data types that are very precise um, for lots of per different jobs. It's got a complete set of data types for networking. So you can actually store MAC addresses IP addresses, IPv6 addresses, and actually query them. So you can actually query each octet of an IP range if you want. Uh, it, it knows how to store uh, geographic primitives or um, geographic primitives or um, geom geometric primitives. In other words, it knows what a circle is mathematically. You give it x, y plus r. So you give it the three digits, it'll tell you this circle's here, it's, that's its radius. So you can actually query, give me sir, give me all the results where the circles are smaller than this radius. Um, which is why Postgres is the leading database for, for GIS, other than Oracle. Uh, the reason why Postgres is leading, because it's free. Uh, GIS on Oracle is hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's expensive, and it requires the insane amount of hardware, whereas you could probably run it, run Postgres on a netbook. And still be able to do geographic mapping with it. So you know the guys upstairs in their military uniforms taking the GIS program? They use Postgres for that course. Um, that's just a few other data types you'll find inside of Postgres. It's got tons, all kinds of stuff. Um, there is actually one other data type, and I don't mention it as much in the slides because each database server seems to call it something different. It's known as text. Text holds a lot of text. As in, you're limited the amount of disk space you have. So, you know, you go to like Wikipedia and it's got a nice big article. That's stored in a text blob. Uh, you use note-taking software and it takes a little note and it puts it somewhere. It's probably going in a database server of some sort and it's going into a text field. Uh, text fields are slow to query against. That's, you know, you use them when you have to. You, otherwise, you don't. But it's not a primitive type because it's basically Varkar on steroids. Um, in Postgres, you can have a 5,000 5, character Varkar field. So, you know, sometimes text is not always what you need. All right. So those are the data types. Um, next one is field design. Rule number one. This is just like programming. Make your field names meaningful. The number of times I've seen databases, this is years ago when there was limitations, where you have to guess what things are called. You have to guess why is it called that? And what was this person thinking? And where does he live now so I can go introduce him to a baseball bat? It, it's happened to me where I spent two and a half months of my career trying to figure out what a database structure was. 
because everything was A1, A2, A3, B3, B5. And it wasn't needed to be like that, but this guy came from an old mainframe mentality where the amount of memory he had access to was really, really small, so he just kept doing it his entire career. And he should have been retired 20 years earlier because those limitations didn't exist 20 years before I took over that project. But he never changed his habits. And he, when he left, he took his booklet with him that explained what everything was because he was not happy. So, you know, that was a really shitty job. Um, so make your meaning, field names meaningful. Depending on the database server, you do have a limit how long they can be. Postgres is like 255 characters. If you can't fit your field name in 255 characters, you might want to rethink what you're calling your stuff because that's just excessively long. Um, decide on a naming convention and stick throughout the design. So if you where you work has a naming convention, use that. Don't invent a new one just because you feel like being special that day. If you don't have one, come up with one that you're willing to use till the end and that everybody agrees to so that there's no surprises. I've given you what the naming conventions are for this course at the end of slideshow too, so you shouldn't have any questions on that topic for here. Try to make an informed guess as to the maximum size they will be. So a good example is license plate numbers in Ontario. They're currently seven digits long, but you can actually order them up to eight, di eight, eight characters to go get a vanity plate. There will be a day where eight won't be enough anymore. So theoretically, you might want to give that extra room. Uh, one good example of maximum size of data is American postal codes. Um, up till about 15, 20 years ago, all you ever needed for a postal code was how many characters? Five. Right, anybody remember that really shitty show in the 90s, Beverly Hills 90210? Right? All you needed was the five digits for the postal code. It's the only American zip code I remember. So, you know, 90210. And you've got five. But nowadays, suddenly realize, hey, five numbers covers an area with a million people now. It got to the point where sending mail was getting difficult. So they said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to fix this. We're going to add a routing extension. So now it's five digits with a dash and up to four more digits on the other side. So suddenly all these old systems that thought the God on his truth was five suddenly needed ten. The rule of thumb is take a guess at how long you think the data is going to be, then pad it a little bit. I mean, this was like, they doubled the size of the postal code. That was ridiculous. They could have used letters instead, and it probably would have been a better idea if they went with hexadecimal numbers, you know, for the, the next set of digits. They wouldn't have needed as much. But take a guess how much data it's going to be and add a little bit to that just to be on the safe side. Uh, name your relations, also known as tables, in an appropriate manner. Again, A as a table name is not acceptable. Neither is B, C, or D. It means nothing. Meaning, make it have meaning so people know what they're looking at. Um, sometimes it's a little hard when you're dealing with dealing with concepts that are a little, you know, out there. But you do as good a job as you can without writing an entire novel either. It's you know you're trying to find a compromise of length versus sanity. And you know, A and A one was bad. Those are really bad time. Because the guy is dad base table is called A, and the columns are called A1, A2, A3. Table 2 is B, B1, B2, B3. So it's it was bad. Field design number two. Keep all the names lowercase. This is I've covered in my naming conventions, but there is a reason for that. Postgres is case sensitive. Very case sensitive. It cares a lot cares a lot more than most of us in the room do about a lot of things. Microsoft SQL Server sometimes is case sensitive, sometimes it's not, depending on what code page you install it on. So what language the operating system is on will determine if it's case sensitive. MySQL is not case sensitive at all, unless you make it be case sensitive. You have to go out of your way to make it do that, um, which is kind of dumb in a way. Um, and Oracle lies. In other words, it lets you put in your stuff mixed case and then in the system tables it actually stores everything uppercase so that it doesn't need to think about what you're doing. It just converts everything you're doing to uppercase and then uses that. 
So it's like magic sauce. Uh, but it lies. Um, that's just what it does. So why would you keep it all lowercase? That way, every, it works everywhere, regardless. So if you design it so it's case sensitive for Postgres, you can convert the structure to MySQL fairly painlessly. It'll work there. Convert it to Microsoft SQL Server. It'll work there fairly painlessly. Convert it to Oracle as it lies anyways. Therefore, you know, might as well make, keep it lowercase. Make it easier that way. Don't use spaces. Again, that's in my naming conventions. There's a reason for that also. Spaces are keyword delimiters in SQL, the language we're going to be learning in a couple of weeks, a couple of three weeks. And if you're using spaces to separate out keywords, how does it know that the table has a space in it? Then you have to use what they call quoted identifiers. And different database servers do it differently. Postgres uses double quotes. MySQL uses a backtick. If anybody here has ever used SQL Server or Access, they'll know exactly what I'm going to say next. Square brackets. Everywhere. On everything. Square brackets on top of square brackets. It's terrible. It's, it's, it hurts your eyes to look at it. So if you don't use spaces, you don't need to quote identifiers. Use an underscore if you want to separate your words. Stick to the basic data types whenever possible. Why? Anybody want to take a guess why you'd want to stick to the basic data types instead of using the fancy schmancy database server specific ones? Think about it a little bit for a second. Sometimes yes, but it's actually not so much to do with the data, a database server specifically. No, not quite. That's not it. That's it. So you create a database with basic data types on, on Postgres and you need to bring it to Microsoft SQL Server. They all support the same basic data types and they're all called roughly the same except for Oracle because it's dumb. Oracle's really good at what it does. It just really sucks to work with. So if you're using Varkar, Varkar works on MySQL, works on Postgres, works on Microsoft SQL Server. It's called Varkar 2 in Oracle because it's special. But Varkar is Varkar everywhere. If you're using a data type on Postgres called Mac, Mac address, it doesn't, I don't think I've seen another database server, a server other than Oracle that has supports it unless you're willing to pay for it. You know, so that's kind of gross. Stick to basic data types whenever possible. Sometimes if you're doing something like GIS, like geographic information systems, you can use geometric data types because that's what that is. You know, that's what it's made for. But if you're doing a, say you're a customer relation management system or an accounting system, you don't need the fancy data types to do that job. Unless you need them, don't use them. All right. Mapping data types to fields. That's the next step. Now, I already covered a little bit of this. How long does the field need to be? So if we know for a fact that a postal code in Canada is always six characters, and depending how you want to store it, you know, it might be seven, right? K1, K space, 1, K1. Or do we keep the space or not? In England, it's the same size of postal code, the space in the same spot, just the letters and the numbers are flipped around because they're special that way. In Australia, you need four digits because that's how few postal codes they actually have in Australia because most of the country is dead and trying to kill you. Other parts of the world, the postal codes are different. Or there's places where they don't even use postal codes. So, you know, depending on the size you need, you take a guess. How long does it need to be? And then you would, if you're not sure, you start asking around to find out what the maximum length is going to be. Should I plan for slightly larger data? What is the answer to that? Yes. By default, you should go with yes on that question. Because no matter what, there's always going to be one person that's going to break the rules. There's always going to be that one person. Uh, when I used to work for Digital Compact, digital, I was there for both for when they were, became one. Um, 
I was in charge of a call tracking system for a very specific group of customers, of users in the building. And one of our customers was a department of the government of Ontario. Back then, whoever came up with the policy for what an email address should be of the government of Ontario was taking some really good juice because dude was whack. I hit this lady whose email address would not fit into a, into a 60 character long email field. I didn't create that database. I inherited it. 60 characters was not enough to hold an email address. Let's think about that for a second. She had a hyphenated first name and it wasn't like Joanne with a hyphen. She had like a big long first name with a hyphen and a big long second first name. And guess what? She was from Quebec. Now, those of you who might not know what that means, she had a hyphenated last name. Now, for those of you who noticed, my last name is pretty long. Take my last name, and she married someone with the same last name with one letter difference. So the, her last name was like 27 characters long. So long first name dash, long second first name period, first last name dash, second last name at. Already, you've already typed up half a novel. Then, they used to have this idea of, hey, we're going to put in the entire department name in French and English. So, natural resources dash ressources naturelles dot on dot gov or dot, yeah, no, dot gov dot on dot ca. It was insane. And, you know, ressources naturelles is actually really short. You know, there's some that were a lot longer than that. So essentially when she was done, her email address was literally like 72 characters long. I pitied anybody who had to type in her email address because you're guaranteed you're not going to get it right, ever. And that was the day I discovered that, you know, maybe I want to give myself lots more space for data. <laughs> because I had to rewrite parts of the application to support one person's email address. Uh, the Millennium issue, which is going to, another one's coming up shortly, is they were, you, the way they were storing dates was two digits. The year. So once you hit zero, zero, you're back at 1900, not 2000. And lots and lots of us worked lots and lots of overtime to make sure the lights never went out. Or the data centers didn't blow up. Yes. That's such as this person, yeah, we actually put it in the comments field for in her case. So, you know, the comments field could take long chunks of text. They actually paste their email address at the top. The problem is the system was unable to send her notifications every time there was an update to her ticket because we weren't storing her email address. But yeah, I like I modified, I altered the tape database, made the field bigger than that, altered the application so it would take more than 60 characters. There was nothing else I could do with that. Just this one person, every time they needed to contact her, they needed to literally copy-paste her email address until it went through QA and it was accepted and, you know, deployed. It sucked. Uh, is the data text numeric, date time of some sort? In other words, figure out what kind of data is going to go in. Use the appropriate data type. Um, obviously, if it's, if it's numbers stored in a number field of some sort, decimal, integer, float, why? Because it's a number. Character fields take up more room on the on the disk, even though today we think about our, you know, terabyte size drives and that's nothing, but it's still room. Um if you're dealing with a small database, who cares? You're dealing with a, you know, a really big debt, millions, and millions of rows, those extra little bits take up space. It's also faster to do searches on numbers when they're numbers than searching on a number when it's a string because you gotta do conversions. So use the appropriate data type. Um, now, when we're talking about numbers, because believe it or not, numbers are pretty much the most complicated data type in a database server, does it need decimal places, yes or no? And this is not one where I say automatically, yes, always make sure there's decimal places, because, you know, if you're counting uh, quantity and it's not weight-based, it's not like you can go to the cash register and sell half an apple. You buy the one Apple. It's not like you go and to the cash register and pay for half a laptop unless it's an Apple. Because you're not paying for a good OS. 
but you're buying the whole computer, not half the computer. So unit quantity often is a an integer. Um, there's other things you use integers for, and same thing with decimal places. If you're dealing with money, there's decimal places. <coughs> How many decimal places of precision do I need to worry about? A lot of people say two for money. Go for four. You can always round it to two when you display. Other things, for example, where um, places of precision would be if you are doing uh, weights, 1.5 kilos or 1.65 kilos, how many decimal places? Maybe you only ever need the one. You just have to learn what the data is and discuss with the appropriate people and pick it. Can the numbering be negative? Now, this is an interesting question because in some database servers, you have the ability to make your integers unsigned. Unsigned means there's no such thing as a negative. It doesn't know what a negative is. Uh, Postgres does not have unsigned integers. So it allows you to go into the negatives with all numbers because of how it stores its numbers. MySQL, on the other hand, you can create your integers to be unsigned, which allows you to store one more factor of numbers in it. So if you have a signed integer and you say, you know, okay, you have, let's say it's, uh, it'll hold five digits because I just don't want to go very big, right? So it's a 95, and it has a, it allows for negatives. The most you can store is 9,999 because it's reserving one space for the negative. If you make it unsigned, you can 99,000. And it occupies the same amount of space because you're not storing the fact that it can go positive, negative. Like I said, some servers care, some don't. You should find out whether or num not the number should be allowed to go negative. Uh, on the other side, how big can this number get? Again, that's just so you pick a, the right size of integer. If you're going to pick up a real versus a float, because you know reals and floats, even though they're essentially the same thing, how they're stored is different. How how the rounding happens is different. Um, when looking at dates and times, you need to store both the date and the time. Um, the answer usually to that question is yes. You want to store both because it's easier to ignore certain pieces of information than to invent pieces of information. By that, for example, for most people, most systems, date of birth is date of birth. They'll never ask you what time of day were you born. They don't care. That's one of the few cases where you can get away with just a date. On the other hand, let's say you have an ordering system. It's an older system, and they said, okay, the order date. And you just store the date. So all you know is, you know, what day the, were the orders placed on. Suddenly, you have a manager comes around and say, what time of day do most people shop at? We don't know because we're not storing the time. Now, if you were storing the time right from the beginning, you could go and query the database to find out time. But if you weren't storing it at the beginning, you can't invent information when you don't have it. So that's why when you when I talk about storing dates and times, just go with the full size, full fat version. The amount of space it occupies is tiny. And it's better off to have that extra information than not have it. Because you can always just, you know, truncate and display the date and only the date. But you can't invent time. Okay. Now, again, this is still physical design because uh, last week I talked about the many-to-many -many relationships where, and I actually did cover the associative entity a bit. So, but there is two kinds of associative entities. There's a standard associative entity. It has a very limited structure. It only contains the primary keys of the associated tables. So, for somebody's going to say, well, what do you mean by that? Oh, look, I got a marker. So, if I had a table that was called, well, no, I don't have a marker. Now I have a marker.
So, you have an associative entity. The basic kind. All it has is two columns in it. The primary key from each of the parent tables. And these make up the primary key of this table. That's all that's in it. So, an associative entity will have just the two. And all it does, it links two tables so that you can have a basically a many many relationship. So that's a basic associative entity. It has very limited use because you can only ever have the pair in there once. And maybe there might be times where you want it to happen more than once. So somebody came along the ride and said, well, we'll create something called an associative entity with attributes. Essentially, it's an associative entity just like this, but you've added extra stuff to it to make it useful. Um, in here, we could suddenly have a quantity and the sell price, um, maybe a discount. Suddenly, it's still an associative entity, but there's extra attributes. So now that's the difference between an associative entity is this. Associative entity have attributes, just an associative entity that has extra stuff tacked on. So basically, order lines tends to be an associative entity. Um, and then some people will say, well, what happens if I want the same product in the order more than once? And some people say, well, why would that be? Well, let's just say you buy product number one, it's full price. If you buy it a second time in the same order, it's half price, you know, buy one, get one half price. So you want to buy two pairs of shoes. They're the same pair of shoes because you really like those shoes. and You know, you're going to wear them out. So you buy two pairs of shoes. First one's full price. Second one is half price. It has to go in twice. So now suddenly this, the fact that this is the primary key doesn't work anymore. So what you end up doing you create a surrogate key and these are just foreign keys now. So now you can have the same thing in the order more than once and it won't care. And you can now query it to your heart's content. It's self-contained. It doesn't break down. So essentially this is also an associative entity with attributes. It just so happens that we've broken how the primary key is made so that it's a single field primary key so that we can duplicate how things are. Like where I work, when we customers place orders to us, we often ship multiple copies of the same product to the customer because we sell it with serial numbers for each one. So we'll have, you know, one sign lab, there's the pin, your copy of sign lab, there's another pin, and the customer needs to know which one, you know. So each product has to go in the same order more than once. This allows you to go do it because let's say you, that you made a mistake and you didn't want to get the second pair at half price. You can still go and delete just the one order line based on this number instead of having to try to guess which one you're after because you're making, you know, combinations of fields. It's just a little easier to work with. Okay, welcome to part two. Normalization. It is an important topic in all of computing. It's a topic that's a little rough to understand because there's so many stupid definitions, it's a topic I absolutely hate teaching. Uh, why? Because I could talk for three periods and half of you guys wouldn't understand until you did it. It's one of those things you can't understand until you've done it several times. So the way I teach it is, I teach you guys what the concepts are, what the terminology is, what these things mean, and then you guys have a lab and you'll work through it on the lab, and then hopefully it'll make sense. Okay, so data normalization, it's a tool, not like a wrench, it's a, con it's a tool, like a for a certain formulas you have to finish pieces of math. You know, you can't do certain things in math unless you use the right formula. <coughs> it's a tool to validate and improve the logical design of a database so that it avoids very specific things. It avoids unnecessary duplication of data. Duplication of data is the worst thing you can do to a database because duplicating data is dumb. It takes up room. It makes things hard to work with. You never really know what the truth is because data, data is duplicated. So 
the process of decomposing relations, in other words, you're taking database tables and or entities and you're breaking them down into the smallest comp pieces is called uh, data normalization. And essentially, it is the process of breaking that stuff down to its smallest component pieces. That's why it's called decomposing. Because when things decompose, they're rotting and falling to smaller pieces. In this case, we're making things into smaller pieces so they can't be broken. Because small things are harder to break than big things. Well, that's the point normalization is to create foreign keys. But it doesn't take care of it by itself. Um, now, we're aiming for what's called well-structured relations or well-structured tables or well-structured entities. They all mean the same thing. I basically, it's a structure that contains minimal data redundancy and it allows users to add, update, insert, update, and delete rows without causing inconsistencies in data. So there's three kinds of anomalies when you're talking about database structures. And the goal is that once you've created your database design, that none of these will happen. <coughs> the insertion anomaly. When you add data, it forces you to create duplicated data. In other words, to be able to add one piece of information, you've got to add something that's not necessarily related because it won't exist without it. Deletion anomaly means if you delete some information, you delete other information that you'll never see again. Maybe, like I've got examples coming up, but as I go through and show you guys what the anomalies are, but that's the definition of a deletion anomaly, is when you delete a row of data, and when you delete that row of data, you happen to also nuke information that's not duplicated anywhere else. And modification anomaly means you need to change data in more than one place unnecessarily. Your voice carries really, really well. You can smack her. Okay. Now, does my next slide actually have a larger version of this? No. Okay. So we have a data table right there. And if you actually got the slideshow on your laptop in front of you, this text will be a little bit bigger. But essentially, this sample has six columns, and when we look at an insertion anomaly, you can't add a new employee without having the employee take a class because you literally can't add them in unless they have a course title um, because the way it's designed, it can't happen that way. Um, deletion, for example, is an employee number 140, um, Alan Beaton. If we nuke Alan Beaton, we're going to lose ex existence about two different things. We're going to lose the fact that department called accounting ever existed. And we're also going to lose the fact that tax accounting was a course the person took and that tax accounting was ever a course anybody could take. Because you got to assume that this data structure you look at is all of the data structure, like all of the data and nothing more. So if I delete Alan Beaton, I lose the fact that accounting department ever happened and that anybody could ever take tax accounting as a course. That's called the deletion anomaly, when you lose something that you that's not duplicated anywhere else. Modification. If I were to give a raise to employee number 100, I have to update two rows to reflect that their salary increased. Because they're in there twice, right? Except for the fact that... Um, their ID stays the same, their name is the same, the department's the same, they've taken two different courses, and their salary is duplicated. So back in the day, it was entirely possible, especially with the old tape-to-tape -tape drives, where as it was updating, the tape would snap. And people think about that nowadays. We're talking about drive computers with SSDs that don't actually have moving parts. Even the old hard drives, you know, the drives would actually stop spinning sometimes. they just die. So partway through the transaction, it would stop, so you'd get... The first entry salary is 48000 and you got to raise by 900 bucks, so salary becomes 48900 It goes to write the second one, and the computer shits the bed. That's a technical term. And now there's a salary that's 48000 
system is fixed, you know, they fix the tape or, you know, they reboot the hard drive, got the computer to come back up. Suddenly, Margaret Simpson has two different salaries. Which one's the right one? We don't know. That's a modification anomaly, as in, in the sense of if you have to modify the same piece of information more than one place, that's a modification anomaly. It's a fairly straightforward uh, definition. The rule is, is you don't want to modify data in more than one place ever. Keep your changes as small as humanly possible. Now, <clears throat> the steps in normalization are as follows. If you have a table with multi-valued attributes, and I'll be talking about those in a minute, you remove the multi-valued attributes, you're now in first normal form. Get rid of the partial dependencies, I'll be talking about those are in a minute. Then your second normal form. Remove the transitives, then you're in third, and then for this course, we're ignoring the second half. Um, essentially, we're only worried about the third normal form. 90% of the time, 95% of the time, that's good enough. Um, the next one after that is called Boyce Cod. It's actually known as normal form third to three and a half. It handles edge cases. And then you got fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, I don't know, there's like 10 normal forms. But pretty much everything past third and boys caught is academic. As in, it's usually only ever used in academic circumstances and or really weird edge cases. Uh, if you're going to get a job with NASA, you probably need to understand past fifth normal form. If you're going to go work for uh, the government of Canada, you're okay with third. You know, it all depends on what you're trying to go for. Okay. As with everything else, there's always terminology. The first piece is functional dependency. The value of one attribute determines the value of another attribute. So in other words, um, an order date depends on the order number. So that's a functional dependency. If you don't have an order number, you can't have an order date because you don't have an order. That's a functional dependency. Candidate keys, I, th I covered that two weeks ago. Uh, but they're a unique identifier. And when we're talking about normalization, we're not talking about primary keys yet, it's just what are the candidate keys. So one of these will become a primary key eventually, but for now they're candidate keys. And each non-key field is functionally dependent on every candidate key. So when you have things that could potentially be a key, a Anything that's non-key, as in a person's name or a person's address, has to be fully dependent on the entirety of the potential key. I'm going to, I've got examples coming. So here's our first example. This is not a valid relation. There's a few reasons. And there's a few ways of displaying this to people. Um, but I'm going to, uh, do I have it? Are you still good? Yeah. Because I'm going to be pointing to both sides and I don't feel like walking back and forth. So this is not valid because see this block right here and I'll go for the other guys. This block right there. God, I suck at circling. These are called multi-valued attributes. In other words, the order ID has three of these in it. But the, this information here is not repeated. Therefore, this isn't a valid relation because it's not complete rows information. A valid row of information will have a row going right across. All the way across. This one doesn't because this is just part of it. So this is where we're starting with is this. And we're going to use this set of data for the rest of the examples for this these slides. Now, how do you fix it? You're not allowed to have multi-valued attributes. This is multi-valued attributes because, well, there's multiple copies of this for every one of those. So first normal form is you're not allowed to have those. So every attribute value is atomic. What I, what, how we fix this one, which is the really, really lazy way, but it's the easiest way when you're first starting out, is we populated the whole row. And all we did is we took this first half here and duplicated for every row here. So now we have fully contained, self-contained rows of information all the way across. So all the way across, you got 
fully contained rows for each one. This is technically in first normal form. We've also identified two possible candidate keys, which is the order number and the product ID. Right, the order number and the product ID. They're underlined up here just to highlight the fact that they're candidate keys. Now, for ex issues with the first normal form example. The first one is the insertion anomaly. For order 107, if we want to add one more thing, so we're down here, see this order 107? It's for you guys on this side, 107. If the person wants to add one more thing to their order, we have to duplicate all of the customer information. So the customer ID, the name, and the address has to be added again to the system. Same thing with the order ID and the order number. So for every time we want to add a single product to their order, we have to duplicate the whole thing in front. And as I described earlier, it's not a good thing to have duplicate data. Now, the deletion anomaly. If we delete the dining room table from order 106, it's gone. It's like it never even happened. So suddenly this company can no longer sell dining room tables because it's not even in their catalog that it even exists. And same thing with the update. For product number four, right there. Four, there and there. If we change the price, we have to change the price in two places. Again, if the system crashes while you're updating the price, suddenly you'll have the same product in the database with two different prices. That's not cool. Because then how do you know which one's the right price? You don't. Unless you go through all the accounting papers and go through all the meetings and figure out which one's the right one. And we all hate meetings. So why do these exist? Because there are multiple entity types in the same table. Now, by entity type, we're talking about what kind of entities are contained inside that table, which leads us back to when we look at Right now we have entity types. You've got orders, you've got customers, you've got products, and you've got quantities. Some of these belong to the order, some of them belong to the customer, some belong to the product. The problem is that we've got one table that has three different kinds of personalities inside of it. So it's suffering from split personality. It doesn't know, one part of it doesn't know what the other part needs, and they're, you know, they get all confused. And we end up having to write software to handle that problem. So to resolve some of these problems, we need to go to the second normal form. First normal form, candidate keys are identified, there's no repeating groups of data, we're good. Second normal form, the rule is, you can't be second normal form unless you're already in first normal form. You can't become a super saiyan unless you're a saiyan. And I hate Dragon Ball, but that's the example most people understand. Right? You can't become one unless you've been the other first. So, now, the next rule for second normal form is every non-key attribute is fully functionally dependent on the entire primary key. That's a big mouthful. I'll demonstrate in a moment. Every non-key attribute must be defined by the entire key and not part of the key. And there's no partial dependencies. So, here's a diagram with all kinds of arrows. And when we look at this, you got the full dependency. So Earlier on, we said, you know, that everything must be fully dependent on the main key. So the quantity ordered is fully dependent on the order ID. The product ID, in this case, is fully dependent on the product ID. you got partial dependencies, where the order date, the customer, the customer name, blah, 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 is partially dependent on the order ID, and the standard price to finish the description is dependent on the product ID. These three columns have nothing to do with the order. These three columns, or four columns, have nothing to do with the product. They're all part of this guy. We're going to talk about transitives later. But essentially what's happening is basically you could picture this table being split right down the middle. And that this belongs to product, this belongs to the order, and this has nothing to do with the order, and this has nothing to do with the product. Those are partials. So when part of the data only depends on part of the primary key, that's bad. You need to break them out. So 
how do we do that? Is we take this big long thing that we had right here. So we take this this big long thing, this big long row of columns, and we split it. We can split it as follows. The order ID and the product ID and the quantity. There we go. That's basically the order. The order line, I should say. The product ID controls the description, the finish, and the price. Is it just me or is that projector out of focus? Maybe it's just my angle. I don't know. Because I'm looking at that one. It's pretty clear. That one's blurry. Um, and then over here, you've got a transitive on here. But we'll take care of those in a minute. But these are all dependent on the order ID. So suddenly we've broken this down. So if we want to change the price of product ID number four, we change it here and only here. We don't need to do it four times. We'd only do it in one place. The order quantity, if we want to change the order quantity ordered, you only need to change it there. Um, same thing with the product description. You know, we want to change the description or the finish. You know, we can do it in one place and only one place. We don't need to do it in multiple places. So this is second normal form. It's okay. It still has problems. Um, specifically, the problems have to do with this this set right there. These transitive dependencies. Um, so, to be in third normal form, you must be in second normal form. Because, yeah, that's how it is. You must have no transitive dependencies. Now, a transitive dependency is a functional dependency. So, we, we already explained what that is. So, essentially, functional dependency is is a column that depends on another column to, to define itself. But it's part, but they're dependent on something that's not part of the primary key. So if I go back right over here, you'll see that the customer name and the customer address depends on the customer ID. It has nothing to do with the order ID or the order date. The order date is dependent on the order ID. And it has nothing to do with the customer. So those are transitive dependencies. In other words, the value of this is determined by this, and the value of this is determined by that. So if we have to go, if while well, you're describing the value of a field, and you say this is determined by this, and this one's determined by that, you have a transitive one. You have to jump twice to get to the primary key. So um, no, the, actually, the weak entity is this one, in this case. You can be a weak entity and be in third normal form. And all it means is that, for example, um, your address is dependent on your student number. But technically, it has nothing to do with your student number. Your address has to do with, say, your, your SIN number, your passport number, and then your passport number is tied to your student number. It's you, once you have to jump two sets of keys to get to the primary key of whatever piece of data you're looking at, then you're dealing with a transitive dependency. Once you have to jump twice. And that's actually the hardest concept to understand is this concept of the transitive dependencies. Um, in other words, any column or attribute whose value depends on another field, but that field is not the primary key, is a transitive. In other words, you have to transit through its through its identifier to get to the identifier of the table. Transitive, transit, transport through. Um, there's another explanation right there, which I just finished explaining. So how do you fix second normal form to third normal form? Non-key determinant with transitive dependencies go into a new table. So we break out the customer and put him in their own table. And it becomes a foreign key, like such. So at the top, this is what we had earlier, where we have the address, the name and the address is dependent on the customer ID. And we want to break that down so that the customer ID is a, with its name and address is its own table. And then we just have a foreign key in the order. That means that if we want to change the customer's address, we need to change it in one place. Yes. 
Yes, then you wouldn't learn the definition of a transitive dependency. I would do it in one step because I've been doing it for long enough that I do it automatically without thinking. As a student, as someone who's trying to learn how to do this, you should think about these things so that you don't make mistakes. Yes, you could have right at the beginning. The problem was that originally the customer ID was not part of the primary key. So if it had been part of the primary key, then it would have been done second or it would have gone right from first to third. But because customer ID is not part of the primary key of this table, that the order ID and the product ID were the primary keys, but the customer ID was not, that, be, that creates a transit, transitive dependency which has to be taken out later. Right? Because you were able to identify the fact that this should have been broken out earlier doesn't mean you could have done it right then and there and we would have resolved the transitives in one step. But you might not understand the implications of what you're doing if you don't take each step. You know when you're learning calculus, almost everything in calculus has two ways of doing it. The fast way and then the way the teacher wants you to do it, right? Show all the steps versus, you know, the shortcut version, which might only be three steps because you can skip half the steps of the long form, but they want you to do the long form so you actually understand what's happening between the short steps. That's what this is. I'll use that as an example because, you know, calculus is a terrible topic. And uh, there's so many ways of doing the same thing, and the teacher usually wants you to do it with one way so that you can demonstrate you understand the principles. So our original orders table becomes two separate tables so that we can update the customer's name in only one place. Because then if all you have is an ID, so it's customer, you know, 45, this is going to be 45, that's 45, and that's Joe Bob that lives in Kentucky. Now, Joe Bob becomes Billy Bob because he decided to become Billy. We don't have to worry about the IDs because this, this order is only connected to that primary key. Just like, you know, if you have a student number here at the school and you suddenly decided to change the change the fact that you now have two names instead of one, you can add a second last you can now add a last name if you want. It's not going to affect your student records because it's just a descriptor tied to your student number. Because the system is no norm denoise normal denormal is normalized enough that you only need to change your name in one place. Well, not really at the school, but you know, we're gonna pretend the school's database is well organized. So our final result looks like this. So we went from that nice horizontal thing to, to a set of tables. We have the customer table, which has a primary key of ID, a name, and an address. We have a product with a product ID, the description, the finish, and the standard price. You have the order, which has the date, the primary key of the order ID, and a foreign key for the customer ID. Again, if uh, Billy Bob was to become Joe Bob, they just need to change the name here because it's going to be carried through the relationship. And on the order line, you got the order ID and the quantity product ID and the order quantity. The quantity ordered, then that would get basically do that. So earlier you said, is that a weak entity? This one's the weak entity because it doesn't have a primary key, a true primary key of its own. It has a primary key, but it's made up out of the foreign keys from the other two tables. Thus, it's weak because it can't live without its identifying partner right there for the ones on this side of the room. See, that says primary foreign key. Essentially, the primary key is made up of only foreign keys, and this one cannot exist unless there's values around it to define it. Yep, pretty much. So, now if I'm right, this is the last slide. It is. So, what time is it? Ten minutes before I finish, so I'm going to use this as my starting point for talking about uh, going back to the physical design stuff I did at the start of the class. Now, for example, if we looked at a person's name, what kind of data type would you use for a person's name? We're not in Java, Varkar, and you know at this point you'd have to think about how long should the person's name be. Oh, easily fifty. Often, you know, you can go with a Varkar 100. It's only going to occupy the amount of space for the characters. So give yourself lots of room. Um, customer address. Oh, right now we're still talking logical, right? 
what's what's one of the rules? This is also known as a um, composite attribute at this point because we haven't broken it out. An address is made up of multiple pieces. We can't talk about what data type it is because it contains multiple pieces of data. That's why it's known as a composite. When we go to physical, we have to break out that address. And I'll be covering that stuff next week at the start of the class. Uh, that was a trick question, actually. The, the an address is actually made out of, usually you'd have street one, street two, city, political division. And, you know, I'm being politically correct for everybody in this class because there's provinces, there's states, there's counties, there's, you know, insert, depending where you're from in the world. You know, they call it something different. Um, you'll have a postal code, possibly a country. So that one, that one there is like six pieces of data. Um, order date. What kind of data type would you use for the order date? What did I say earlier? Yes, timestamp. Why? Because you can't manufacture time. If suddenly we want to know how, uh, when the majority of the orders come in, if all you have is the date, we can tell you, well, we get most of the orders on Mondays. What time on Monday? Maybe we need to staff extra people, you know, Monday at 1 o'clock in the afternoon to start packing stuff up, as opposed to maybe we don't need two people in shipping on Fridays because there's no orders going on on Fridays, but maybe on Mondays we need two people. Or Monday afternoons we need two people. So you'd use a timestamp or a date time depending on the database server. Um, product description. You could use text depending on what we're aiming for, right? If it, the product description is dining room table, you probably get it with a var car. But that'd be like the, the name of the product. This one here is actually missing a little bit, this structure, because we're going for basic examples, right? Honestly, you'd have a product name, which would be a var car, whatever it would be, say 100, if you want to read, really give it nice long names. The description would be a text. That would be, this is a wonderfully designed table with a three-quarter inch, um, you know, tempered glass surface, chrome legs that expands by pulling, anyways. You could write a minor novel describing this product. I'm just, I was actually describing my dining room table, so, you know. Product finish. That one, honestly, depending how you want to handle it, if it was up to me, I'd have repeating values in this, and I'd probably want to break it out to another table. I mean, how many times do you need to type in walnut, oak, glass, chrome? I mean, there's only so many finishes you can put on a, on a piece of furniture. Therefore, uh, you, most people would take that and break it out as a separate table, and actually, you may create a reference table out of it. A lookup table, also known as a lookup table. Standard price. Money if your server supports it, but not all servers support it. So therefore you'd use either numeric or decimal. They all, basically all money is, is an alias to a, to a, uh, to a decimal with two places reserved. So you go like money 10. What it actually is, it's actually going to do a, a decimal 12 comma 2. It'll reserve 10 digits for the number with two for the decimal place. It, it's basically magicking. You know, it's, it's hiding what's actually happening behind the scenes. So you're better off using the primitive types. So that, that, so that they're the basic data type so that, you know, it's portable and people actually know what's going on. So you'd use a decimal or numeric. They're the same. There's different servers called different things. And depending on how much you sell your stuff for, you know, so like we could go with this with, uh, Six comma two, six by two, so nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars and ninety nine cents. That's an expensive table, an expensive dining room set. You know, unless it's gold plated, but then odds are you're not worried about this database structure. Um, quantity ordered. In this case, we'd use uh, quantity ordered. Uh, can we ship half a table? So what do you use for whole numbers? Somebody said it over here. Just say integer. So you use an integer. Yeah, you could choose how big an integer. That's your choice you have at this point is how big an integer can this be? You know, can they order, you know, 49 trillion tables? Oh, damn, if they could. I'd be happy. The company would be happy that the guy could retire right then and there. But you'd probably use something like a small integer, which is still going to be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of tables. 
Um, you just use the smallest, in this case, the smallest number to do the job because there's no point storing something bigger. And I've had people ask me, well, what difference does it make if you use a big integer versus a small integer? Because they're all integers. And our hard drives are big enough now that realistically the amount of space it occupies is not really that different. However, as a programmer, when you're looking at the database structure, you're trying to put in some basic rules. And as a, and like anything else, you should use a data type appropriate to what you're working with so that it makes sense for other people that have to come in later. I mean, using a big integer for a quantity field is insane. You're literally doubling the amount of space you need to store a number for something that's never going to happen. It's like saying, oh, I'm going to have a six-car garage attached to my 1,200-square-foot house because I might have five cars one of these days. No, you're not. Not if your house is only 1,200 square feet. You know, so there's... You could theoretically create it that big, but you'll never use it. Therefore, don't bother. Use, you know, instead of a five-car garage, have a one-car garage with a pool. Use up the space you need. Okay, so. In conclusion. This week, you're working on lab four, which is basically lab two, where you actually have to think about it a little bit. That's what lab four is. It's lab two, applying the concepts you've heard over the last two weeks to it. Uh, again, you should be, you know, doing the reading, if applicable. Uh, you probably should be doing some of the first hybrids. There's associated reading with every week. So if you go look at the current week, week four, there's probably so there may be associated reading with it. It's not required reading. It's just to help round you out. Um, some of you have noticed that I posted a booklet and I've, I've received six panicked emails because God forbid I gave you guys extra information. Is that stuff we need to study for our test? No. Is it stuff that's handy to read? Yes. Before this course had a textbook, that's what I used was that booklet. So it's like 78 pages of information about this course condensed in very short, sweet examples. And it covers... Many of the things I've talked about with different wording. Therefore, maybe you didn't understand what I said in class. Go read through that booklet. It literally is like in the order I'm teaching the stuff, more or less. So, yes, you can go read it. No, it's, I can't use it as a test because it's not required reading. But it's useful to know. Um, next week, the way it's going to work is I am going to do in three pieces. Part number one will be me discussing the assignment and the test. Because there's one of those two coming. That'll be the first bit of the class. Probably the first 15, 20 minutes of the class will be me discussing the assignment and the test, the rules of engagement, what else goes on with that. Then those that don't want to stick around for those of the class can leave. And I guarantee some people are going to leave. Because that's just how it is. Then I'm going to talk about um, common data patterns. There's no slides for this because... I can't, I'm not testing on it. Um, but this is me going through, you know, when we're talking about an address, how should you define an address in the database? How do you define phone numbers, email addresses, names, that kind of stuff. Common patterns of data you'd find in the database. Uh, it's useful information, but not tested upon thus. You know, if you feel like being here, great. If you don't, your assignment's probably going to hurt a little bit for it, but you know. Uh, and then after that, I'm going to do, um, you know how I diagrammed last week on the board? I'm going to go from start to end, an entire from conceptual to logical to physical. So you see all the steps, which is essentially what you're doing for the assignment. So I'm going to be doing a similar version of the assignment, a similar concept as to what's the assignment, but I'm going to do it on the board. So I'll still be recording all of it so you can watch it after the fact, but you just won't be here to participate or understand if you have any questions. So other than that, that's it. We're done. No problem.